The following podcast is entirely a work of fan fiction. It is unofficial, unaffiliated, and unauthorised. Neither the podcast, nor any individual involved in its production, is now, nor has ever been, in any way associated with HBO, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, or the Song of Ice and Fire book series. The podcast was, is now, and shall always be entirely without profit. Neither the podcast directly, nor its makers indirectly, generate or receive any form of revenue or financial restitution that might otherwise accrue to the rightful copyright holders. The following podcast is entirely a work of fan fiction. We hope you enjoy it. Brienne's body is laid out on the bed. At first glance, one could almost believe she is merely sleeping peacefully. Jamie and Podrick stand at the bedside. It's time, Podrick. Podrick reluctantly nods. Jamie turns to the door and addresses the guards that since his arrival have shadowed his every movement, save for those dreadful few that mattered most. See that her body's burned immediately. The others too. The woman next door, the guard in the hall, and the night's watchman in the room opposite. We're your guards, Kingslayer, not your servants. Do what he says. Do it quickly. The guards recognise that Podrick will accept no argument and obediently enter the room as Jamie and Podrick exit. The body of the guard cut down by the fleeing Bronn lies where it fell in the corridor, that of Tormund's failed assassin visible through an open door. As Jamie and Podrick pause at the last room on the left, Sam kneels over Ed's body, trying in vain to hold back tears. Sam, it's time. Sam nods, turns back to Ed. We shall never see his like again. Your watch has ended, brother. Sam takes a last look at his friend, then rises to his feet. He follows after Jamie and Podrick, a trail of bloody footprints charting his course across the naked stone. Passing the crypts on their way across the yard, the hound holds out a hand and halts Gendry. For fuck's sake! Gendry follows the hound's eyeline to the still open entrance to the crypts, the pile of stones left untouched by its side. Oi! Horsefucker! The hound grabs the arm of a Dothraki captain hurrying past, The captain doesn't even break his stride as he shrugs off the hound and continues on his way. I'm pretty sure they have names, you know. You can't tell one from another. They all look the fucking same. I bet they don't say the same about you. The hound spots Toru, leading his mount across the yard. I thought you were told to seal that crypt up. Go back and abuse my rat. Exasperated, the hound beckons to Gendry. Come on, let's get that hammer of yours warmed up. The hound finds a heavy mallet beside the stack of stones, and he and Gendry smash the columns supporting the crossbeam of the crypt's entrance. The entrance collapses, the pile of rubble sealing off the crypt. If you want a job, do it right. Proud of their work, the hound and Gendry follow after the crowd hurrying to their positions. On their way, they pass a captain in the Stark Guard as he corrals the last of his archers up the steps to the battlements. To the wall! Hurry! To the wall! Tyrion strides from the castle and weaves his way across the busy yard, passing beneath the looming frames of two enormous trebuchets. He climbs the battlements and walks along the line of archers and their well-stocked quivers. Missande is waiting for him, She takes up her signal torches, her shaking hands causing her to drop one of the sticks to clatter on the stone floor. Tyrion retrieves it for her and holds her hands steady in his own. He attempts a reassuring smile, 
but his pained grimace betrays his own fear barely held in check. Jamie takes his position at the head of the eastern body of Northmen and Free Folk, Podrick sheepishly assuming Brienne's position at the head of the Western. Sam falls in behind him and beside Davos. Tormund arrives to take command of the Free Folk, the torn strip of bedsheet wrapped around his head already soaked through with blood. Gendry and the Hound have found Beric and formed up alongside. The Lightning Lord runs a hand over his sword. A trail of flames follows after his fingers, the steel transformed into a blade of pure fire. Tyrion looks out over the army of the living. The Unsullied stand in meticulous rank directly below Tyrion's position, occupying the center of the host. At their front, Grey Worm dons his helmet. To their left, half the Northern Army's total number, the Free Folk beside them. The other half is arranged to the Unsullied's right, Beric in the midst casting about anxiously for Gendry and the Hound. Arranged on the far left and far right flank, the two halves of the Dothraki cavalry, the left led by Jorah, the right by Quano. 300 yards out from the front line, six shield walls made of stone and manned by three archers apiece. 200 yards further, a trench of wooden stakes, 10 yards across and lined with oil-soaked logs. After 200 yards of flat open ground, a second trench line, and beyond this, a line of wooden chevaux de frise, the wood whittled into sharp points and treated with pitch. Finally, the field of fire itself, open ground as wide as Winterfell and some 400 yards deep. At its center, a stone wall as tall as two men and five feet thick, shaped into a wide V, an opening perhaps 10 feet wide at its point. Beyond the field of fire lies nothing but snow-covered ground, the ancient forest cleared all the way to the foot of the hill range that lines the horizon. It is into this darkness that all eyes peer for their first glimpse of the undead army soon upon them. A stillness settles over the scene, every soul among the ranks of the living straining their senses to discern their enemy amid the darkness of the distant horizon. Let's see what we're up against. Zone 3, heavy shot. Missande nods at Tyrion's instruction and lights her two torches. She waves them in predetermined signal at the men below, charged with command of the trebuchets. The trebuchets are loosed. The payload arcs over the walls, over the ranks of the living, over the obstacle-strewn field, lines of brilliant light trailing their progress through the pitch-black sky like a pair of flaming comets. The boulders slam into the ground and roll on, snapping and scattering tree trunks as though they were skittles. By the light of the burning forest, the army of the living get their first look at the Night King's host. 100,000 whites, packed shoulder to shoulder along the horizon, row after row back into the darkness. The ranks of the vast undead horde stand still and silent as statues, seemingly studying the scene below, yet those that still have eyes in their sockets stare as unseeing as do the hollow skulls of fleshless bone that reflect the flames like burnished steel. There is no forethought here, no calculation, no trepidation nor fear. This is death itself, made legion, ready to swallow whole anything that stands before it. Within the northern ranks, farmers and shepherds and craftsmen pressed into service shake with fear at the sudden immediacy of violent and voracious death. Young boys lose control of their bladders. Old men feel their legs turn to suet. Up and down the line, men and women alike add the contents of their stomachs to the ground's squelching slurry. At the head of the eastern flank, a terrified northern soldier breaks formation and retreats towards the sanctuary of Winterfell. Jamie pursues him through the lines, seizing him by the neck and dragging him back into place. No, 
No, no, no, no, no, no, no, please, please, let me go. I can't do this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a stonemason. I'm not a soldier. Everyone's a soldier tonight, son. Jamie retrieves the boy's sword from the mud and thrusts it into his hand. First rule of soldiering. You've got a better chance with this than without. Jamie glares at the audience around him. The next man that tries to run won't live long enough to fight the dead. I'll cut them down myself. From beneath the canopy of burning trees, a line of twelve white walkers emerges, each sitting astride the corpse of a mighty, muscled warhorse. The walker at the center of the line raises his arm, pointing his sword of ice at the sky. Slowly, deliberately, he lowers his blade to point at Winterfell and the army of the living. The army of the undead charges forward. Zone 2, scatter shot. Hold on my mark. Missandei signals to the men below. The front lines of the undead arrive at the two walls of stone and mindlessly charge on, following the angle of the stone towards the opening at the point where the two walls would meet. Sam watches from the ranks as the rear guard of the undead unwittingly follow their forward lines into the corral. Sam's eyes grow wide with excitement and hope. The most determined of the whites make it through the opening in the two walls, but the narrow space quickly becomes a bottleneck. In a matter of seconds, the compacted press of bodies has plugged the opening entirely, and the undead begin to pile up like driftwood, hurled against a damn wall by an unrelenting current. Sam turns his broad grin towards Davos at his side. It's working! Fire! Missandei waves her torches. All eyes look to the heavens as thousands of rocks whiz through the air. The bombardment of stone bullets fizz through the enemy's densely packed ranks, stripping skin and cracking skulls and shattering and separating limbs. Fire well! Missandei delivers the message to the men below. Signal the forward archers! Get those trenches burning! Missandei turns to face the field of battle and performs her routine. Another storm of burning rock rains down on the field of fire, followed quickly by another and then another. The men in Winterfall's yard loading and loosing the trebuchets with synchronic efficiency. The undead scrabble over the growing mountain of dismembered bodies, using the elevation to climb free of the catchment zone. The pile begins to teeter and then topples forward over the walls, whites spilling free in every direction. The stone barriers finally collapse beneath the strain of so many bodies and the irregular trickle of whites becomes a veritable tsunami. Bran stands beside the Weirwood tree, but rather than the walls of Winterfell's Godswood, there is nothing around him but the vast open fields and rocky hills of nature in its most unspoiled state. This is the North, as it was eight thousand years ago. Bran walks cautiously towards the only feature on the otherwise virginal landscape, the wooden frame of a modest single-room cottage. Close by, a young man chops wood from a felled tree, his shirtless torso bronzed by the summer sun overhead. The man shows no awareness of Bran's presence, even when he stands close enough to smell the sweat of the man's exertions. Bran studies this, confirming a suspicion he was already nurturing. Brandon Stark, the first one, Bran the Builder. Bran's namesake looks up, as though hearing a voice on the wind. Bran follows his eyeline. Far away to the north, beyond the range of hills and the sparse scattering of modest young saplings about their base, a wall of thick black storm clouds screens the horizon. Brandon the Builder furrows his brow at the tempest, so incongruous with the weather this side of the hills. He returns to his labours. Brandon the Builder's head shoots up once more as the calls from the future reach his ears. This time, he looks Bran directly in the face. Taken aback, Bran meets his stare, but the realisation gradually dawns that Brandon the Builder is not looking at him, but at something over his shoulder. Bran turns. 
the Night King shoots out an icy blue hand and clamps it tightly around Bran's throat. Bran, Bran, can you hear me? Bran convulses among the roots of the weirwood tree. Sansa kneels by his side, holding her brother's head in her lap protectively. Theon grabs Bran's hand before his thrashing causes it to separate from the weirwood and pins it firmly to the tree. Bran's convulsions stop and he lies still. Sansa breathes a sigh of relief. Sansa, look! Theon holds back the collar of Bran's furs to better expose the black bruise in the shape of a hand's grip that has inexplicably appeared around Bran's throat. Heeding Masande's signal, the archers placed at their shield walls ignite small troughs of fire in the ground before them, dip the tips of their arrows, and begin adding their own volleys to those coming from the trebuchets. On each flank, Kono and Jora receive their own signal and bark a command. Gue, Ajin! Ajin! Geisa! Three riders on either flank, each bearing a flaming torch, charge their mounts forward. Passing the line of archers and their stone bunkers, the two groups turn in to face each other on either side of the first trench line. As they ride along the trench towards the opposing flank, the Dothraki trail their torches along the oil-soaked logs. The oil ignites, and two lines of flame race towards one another behind the Dothraki torches, creating an unbroken wall of fire separating the two armies. Not since primitive man first conjured a spark with sticks has a fire met with such a rapturous welcome. Bran stands by the Weirwood once more, only now the surrounding countryside has been replaced by the interior of the Red Keep's throne room. The Mad King sits upon the Iron Throne, his long white hair hanging loose and wild about his gaunt features, the soiled fabric of his robes hanging loose from his angular frame. Standing before the throne, Chief Pyromancer Wisdom Rossart, Past fifty, portly and proud, Rossart genuflects before his king. Beside Rossart, a face Bran recognises instantly, despite preceding the form with which he is more familiar by almost twenty years. Your Grace, listen to reason. My father's men are already within the city walls. They will be at your door any minute now. Surrender and prevent any more needless bloodshed, I beg you. Barely out of his teens, beautiful and golden in the full bloom of swaggering youth, Jamie's fresh and wrinkle-free face is at this moment stretched and strained in desperate earnestness as he tries to reach his unravelling king. Jamie Lannister. Bran realises his mistake as soon as the words have escaped his lips. Aerys cocks his head, holds up a finger for silence. Do you hear that? Your Grace, the stores of wildfire you bade me hide throughout the city will soon be beyond our grasp. What would you have me do? Aerys flinches in pain as he cuts his hand on one of the Iron Throne's many blades. The Mad King sucks at his wound. The sounds of battle fill the throne room, and Eris looks to the rafters as though expecting to see the ceiling split open and the heavens fall down upon his head. Your Grace? The echo of snarling whites tells Bran that these are not the sounds of the sack of King's Landing, but those of the Battle of Winterfell, twenty-five years hence. Eris is forced to cover his ears with his hands and cringe into the corner of his throne like a beaten cur. Bran, recognising the effect the noise is having on the Mad King, hopelessly pleads with the empty air around him. Stop! Please! You have to stop! The Mad King tentatively lowers his hands and sits forward. Aris unfurls a long, skeletal finger and aims it at Jaime. You! Bring me your traitorous farmer's head! I command you in the name of your king! Jamie's jaw tightens, and his right hand moves to rest on the hilt of his sword. And you! Aris turns his finger to Rossart. Burn them! Burn them all! Burn King's Landing to the ground! Let the usurper be king of naught but ashes! 
Before Jamie can protest, the Mad King shows his back to the room and stalks into the shadows on the far side of the Iron Throne. Bran hurries after him. Maybe he can still salvage this. Wait, come back! The Night King steps from the shadows into the light. Bran sprints down the long approach to the Iron Throne, towards the tall twin doors at its end. Bran hurls himself headlong into the darkness beyond. Bran looks about, confused, but relieved to find himself no longer in the Red Keep, but instead within the familiar surroundings of Winterfell's yard. With a shiver of realization, he notices that each exhalation is hanging in the air as a visible cloud of white. The Night King strides towards him through Winterfell's gates. Bran whips his head around, desperately searching the yard for safety or sign of rescue. His gaze turns unconsciously in a familiar direction. Bran begins to climb the broken tower. Coming level with a familiar window, Bran ignores the hollow feeling of dread in his stomach and pulls himself above the sill. The Night King is already there, waiting. Bran's body jerks clean off the ground. Bran! A trickle of blood escapes Bran's ear and spatters on the dulled silver of the Weirwood's roots. The sky is on fire as another storm of flaming boulders and burning arrows arc their way across the sky. But the Night King's army is on the move and the bombardment overshoots its mark. The undead horde sprints wildly towards Winterfell, eating up the open ground in the time between two heartbeats. The first wave reaches the line of Chevaux de Frise and immediately impale themselves upon its sharp wooden stakes. This first wave is quickly followed by a second and a third, until all the tines are covered beneath pinioned whites. The next to arrive barely break their stride as they charge up and over the line of bodies blanketing the Chevaux de Frise, careering on towards Winterfell until finally coming to a sudden halt before the trench of fire. The forces of the living watch on, currents of hope crackling through their ranks. Far back in the darkness, the white walkers stretched along the tree line look to the skies in unison. A sudden canopy of impenetrable black storm clouds slide beneath the stars. Cavalry, deploy! The words have barely passed Tyrion's lips when the heavens open and the clouds empty. He watches on with the rest of the living as the wall of fire holding the Night King's army at bay is immediately extinguished. The undead cross the sodden trench and resume their charge. The torches! Missande stares aghast as the flames fizzle away in the rain. Don't panic. We planned for this. Missande nods and tosses the useless torches aside picking up two makeshift signal flags made of wooden poles bearing squares of thick white cloth. If only trenches filled with flags were so effective a substitute. Receiving Masande's signal, Kono and Jorah unsheathe their weapons and turn their horses about to address the men. Ma'ana! Nazaha! Asedat! The cavalry gallops forward in two streams, tens of thousands of Dothraki screamers whooping furiously and brandishing their arachs. They give battle from both sides, the left and right flank turning their mounts towards one another and trapping the undead between their two lines. As soon as they've crossed the width of the battlefield, the Dothraki rein their horses about and charge again, creating a constantly moving ring of pounding hooves and scything steel around the body of whites. For one brief, glorious moment, it looks as though the Dothraki are going to rout the Night King's host. But only for a moment. 
The relentless pounding rain has quickly turned the ground to sludge, every pass of the cavalry compounding the quagmire. First one horse slips and tosses its rider, then a second and a third. Now it's the turn of the living to pile on top of one another, every horse that falls becoming an unavoidable obstacle in the path of those following behind. Jora yanks violently back on his reins, but to no avail. His horse collides with the living wall before it, propelling Jora up and over and into the amorphous mass of human and equine bodies writhing in the mud. The whites swarm upon the fallen. The ranks of the living watch with transfixed horror as the imperious Dothraki, famed the world over as fearsome and expert warriors, are swallowed up by the great churning sea of undead. Jamie searches the battlements for a glimpse of his brother. Come on, Tyrion. As though hearing his brother's demand, Tyrion gives the order. All forces, prepare to engage! Missande frantically relays the order to the signalmen below. Ready! Ouvrier! Ready! Ready! Charge! 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 The undead turn their attention to face the combined ranks of the living, rushing forward to meet them. The two sides collide in a great explosion of metal and steel and bone and flesh. Screams of agony and screams of fury echo around the field. The brown liquid earth churns beneath their feet, sucking the living and dead alike down into its separating filth. Sam clutches his sword in both hands, risking the occasional slash at a passing white, but otherwise maintaining a defensive posture. Podrick cuts down whites left and right, bringing to bear the countless hours of training he spent under Brienne's tutelage. Knocked off balance, he manages to kick an oncoming white backwards and away. The white skewers itself on Sam's upraised blade. Podrick nods his thanks. The Hound and Beric fight together, the Hound's great broadsword and Beric's flaming steel slicing and hacking through the undead army. Where's your fucking god now, Don Darien? He's right here, Clegane. It's his strength that drives my blade. I can feel his light filling my body. No! <laughs> You're full of something, all right. <laughs> From beneath the mountain of mutilated men and horses, Jorah manages to thrust a hand up and out into the air. Help me! Someone help me! Kono clambers up the pile of bodies and takes Jorah's wrist in both hands. Leaning back with all his weight, the Dothraki commander heaves Jorah free. Kono thrusts the nearest sword into his hand, and with the briefest of nods, the knight and the horse lord rejoin the fray. Grey Worm spins like a top, dealing death in all directions at the head of the unsullied lance. While the Northmen give unfocused battle, and the Free Folk fight with greater ill-discipline still, the unsullied move as one, maintaining meticulous shape as they dispatch whites with expert skill. The practice of entire lifetimes is realized in ruthless detail, the world's greatest soldiers running through their lethal repertoire with clinical grace. Tyrion forces himself to look away from the thick of battle and take in the whole field. He sees the line of white walkers watching impassively from the safety of the distant tree line. Now, Missande, give the signal! Missande turns to face out over the battlements and performs a manic flourish with her flags. Far across the battlefield, where the forest meets the foothills on the northwesternmost fringes, the slightest rustle of leaves floats away unnoticed, disguised beneath the cacophony of battle. Agile as a cat, Arya drops from cover. Her chosen unsullied, blue rat, blue flea, yellow beetle, and green cricket, slide down from their own branches and form up behind her. Silently, Arya dashes between the trees, flitting from shadow to shadow, following the hill line and eating up the distance between her and the nearest white walker. Standing beside its warhorse, monitoring the fighting below, 
The first the walker knows of Arya's presence is the Valyrian steel dagger she shanks into its back. In the midst of battle, thousands of whites suddenly crumple to the ground like puppets with severed strings. The white walkers snap their heads around at the sound of their brother's disintegration. Three remain horsed at a slight remove, while the others dismount and descend upon the small band of assassins. The unsullied draw and throw their dragonglass-tipped short spears. Five are dodged, but the sixth finds its home. A second division of whites collapses. Their bodies stomped into the slime by the eager charge of the living, looking to press their sudden advantage. Arya draws a second blade from her belt and pirouettes through the enemy, stabbing and slicing with her daggers as she goes. Two more white walkers explode at the end of her blade. The ranks of the living allow themselves the relief of a mighty cheer at the sight of so many whites scythed down like stalks of wheat. Atop the battlements, Tyrion and Missandei exchange broad, triumphant grins. Arya continues to duck and weave, but fewer of her attacks are finding their mark. Blue Rat and Blue Flea fall in quick succession. Arya lunges a fraction too late, and a blade of ice slices through her arm. Her scream of pain is cut short by the butt of an icy spear cracking into the back of her skull. Yellow Beetle and Green Cricket dive forward and manage to delay the White Walker for the instant it takes Arya to scrabble clear. Yellow Beetle yanks Arya back to her feet. Run! No sooner has Yellow Beetle spoken than a sword of ice explodes through his breastplate. She tries to run, but the White Walkers are already on her. Green Cricket interposes himself and fights off one, then two, then a third, but the fourth buries its axe between his shoulder and neck and cleaves the unsullied in two. Tyrion's knuckles are white as he grips the stone parapet. He squints into the darkness on the far side of the battlefield, desperately trying to discern Arya's escape by the fading light of the burning forest. He loses sight of her in the scrum of blue-white bodies. Come on, get her out of there! Arya raises her fingers to her lips and whistles. On cue, a Dothraki screamer emerges from the trees on both the left and right flank and speeds towards Arya. The rider on the left leans over and holds out his hand as he passes, but Arya is forced to duck a swinging sword and the rider misses her hand. As the Dothraki wheels about for a second pass, a mounted walker pulls a spear of ice from his saddle and hurls it through the horse lord's torso. The second rider is almost within range of rescue, but a single swing from a walker's blade removes his head from his body, the horse galloping away with its decapitated rider still in the saddle. All alone in enemy territory, Arya is in full flight mode now. She evades death a dozen times as she ducks and dives through the icy gauntlet to stay a sliver ahead of the walker's weapons. Tyrion, seeing the danger Arya is in, turns and screams at Passande. Get another Dothraki rider up there now! Passande waves her flags, but to no avail. There's nobody left to see the signal. Tyrion sees for himself that the Dothraki signalmen are gone. He scans the field, but every man still drawing breath is already consumed in the thick of battle and in no position to notice instruction from the battlements. Should I signal for the... No, it's too early to play our last card just yet. Tyrion watches the horizon with impotent frustration. Get out of there, Arya. Gendry buries his axe in the skull of a white and takes a precious second to recover his bearings. He looks to the horizon and sees Arya fighting for her life. Pausing only to retrieve his axe, he takes off across the battlefield towards the White Walker's rear lines. What the fuck are you doing? We have to help her! The Hound follows Gendry's pointing finger. You'll never reach her in time! Much to the Hound's disgust, Beric is already racing after Gendry to join him on his rescue mission. Don't die it! <laughs> Fuck it. 
hound turns and lumbers his way through the crowd. Get back here and fight, Clegane! That's an order! Fuck your orders! The hound barges Jamie from his path in pursuit of Gendry and Beric. Arya retreats to the tree line. Outnumbered eight to one, she feels the seconds of her life pouring like sand through her fingers. The same fingers she flexes, then tightens around the hilts of her dual daggers. Like a pack of dogs that know they have their quarry cornered, the walkers stalk towards Arya, slowly drawing the net closed around her. <laughs> Arya follows the gaze of the White Walkers, turning to face the dark depths of the forest at her back. The confusion on her face dissolves into pure, unqualified joy. A snarling direwolf explodes from the shadows, taking down two White Walkers at once. The first Walker's skull cracks between the direwolf's mighty jaws, the fleeing second seized by the leg and tossed into the air like a rag doll. A second direwolf lunges from the forest and snatches it from the sky. The cloud of ice that blooms from the direwolf's jaw joins its twinkling particles to those of the first walker. The combined remains slowly settling on an otherworldly standoff. The six remaining walkers face down the pack of direwolves that slink from the trees to back their gargantuan alpha. Arya's eyes are bright as stars. Nymeria. At the sound of Arya's voice, Nymeria leaves the white walkers to her pack and bolts to Arya's side. Arya gratefully wraps her arms around her direwolf, grabbing two fistfuls of thick fur. Nymeria half carries and half drags Arya away, while her pack meets blue-white blades with snapping teeth and slashing claws. Gendry, Beric and the Hound watch with slack jaws as Arya streaks past atop her direwolf. Without a word, they turn on their heels and follow back the way they came. Eric and Aaron, Jamie's erstwhile guards, stagger across the yard beneath the weight of their twin burdens. Eric carries Tormund's would-be assassin, Aaron, the Stark guard cut down by Bronn. They drop the bodies on the ground unceremoniously. Go get a barrel of oil from the shed. Why can't you get it? If you'd rather carry down the big woman, then I'm happy to switch places with you. Aaron still looks uncertain. You're not scared, are you? It's what's on the other side of the wall that you've got to be scared of. Not a fucking tool shed. Go. Aaron reluctantly heads off in the direction of the shed. Nymeria delivers Arya to the shadows beneath Winterfell's walls. Arya releases her grip and buries her head in the direwolf's fur. Thank you, girl. Nymeria licks at Arya's tendered palm. In the blink of an eye, Nymeria is gone, melted into the shadows as expertly as her old friend. Arya turns and throws herself into battle where the fighting is thickest. Their numerical disadvantage, further diminished by the dispatch of two more White Walkers and their attendant thralls, the army of the living begin to feel the tide of battle turning in their favour. The end seems to be in sight now, Northmen finally able to spot Northmen as the dense thicket of undead bodies continues to thin. Looking around and finding himself a dozen paces from the nearest danger, Sam grins and catches Davos's eye across a heap of dispatched whites. We might actually win this! At the tree line, the white walkers put the last of Nymeria's pack to the sword. Stepping an imperious foot on the bisected cadaver of a direwolf, the southernmost among their number raises a horn of bone to his lips. As the sound of the horn dies away, another sound rises in its place. Davos glares at Sam accusingly, his face saying more than words ever could. Without averting his eyes, Tyrion instructs Missande. Zone three, heavy shot. Missande signals, the trebuchets are repositioned, loaded and loosed. 
the boulders crash into the ground, not ten yards from the closest white walker. The walker looks at the flaming rocks with disdain. By the light of their fires, Tyrion sees the shadows of the forest begin to dance. The trees begin to shake, the ground itself vibrate. Tyrion recoils as a dozen giants break from the tree line. Close on their heels, 30,000 whites charge towards Winterfell, parting around the White Walkers like a raging river around rocks. The undead reinforcements crash into the army of the living. The giants plough their way through the press of bodies, making a dozen widows with one swipe of their arm, ending entire bloodlines with a single kick. Those fortunate few able to dive away from the giant's path of destruction barely have time to appreciate their escape before flocks of whites descend like ravenous vultures. Tormund fights with a wilding's unrefined ferocity, but in his frenzy he neglects his blindside a moment too long and a pack of whites take him off his feet. Tormund looks to be lost, but deliverance arrives in the unexpected form of Lyanna Mormont, her lightweight blade and diminutive stature allowing her to slink away from the undead's ungainly lunges. Lyanna's personal guard forms a protective semicircle around her as she offers her hand to Tormund. Rising to his feet, Tormund nods his thanks. Look out! Lyanna only has a second to turn and take in her onrushing end. Swinging a thick tree trunk like a bat, the giant sweeps Lyanna and her guard up and away into the distant darkness. Tormund roars with rage and charges the giant. It swings its primitive cudgel, but Tormund is too quick, diving between the giant's legs and hacking with his axe at their heel. The giant drops to one knee. In the same movement, Tormund rolls forward, turns, and two-hand tosses his axe. It spins through the air and lodges itself in the giant's skull. Across the chaos of the battlefield, Jaime nods in appreciation at Tormund's conquest. Tormund grins madly, then raises his gaze over Jaime's head. Jaime turns to find a giant of his own approaching. He takes his stance, determined that he will not be outdone by an unschooled wildling. His bravado falters somewhat when a second giant steps up to join the first. Tyrion spots Jaime amid the sea of bodies. He grabs the nearest archer. Bring down those giants! The dozen archers either side of Tyrion take aim and loose their arrows. Every one hits home, arrows seeming to sprout from the giants like a porcupine's quills, but neither white so much as flinches. Jamie turns and runs, and the giants give chase. Tyrion tilts his head back to take in the wooden platform mounted atop the broken tower, and shouts across the twenty-foot distance to the Stark soldier posted there. Now! Now! The soldier, watching the battle, wild-eyed with fear, doesn't notice Tyrion's frantic calls. Tyrion grabs the nearest archer once more and points to the soldier. The archer fires an arrow inches past the soldier's head. His attention successfully captured, the soldier sees the wildly gesticulating Tyrion and quickly infers his meaning. The soldier takes a knee behind the scorpion and trains it on the first of the two giants, tracking it across the field as it closes ground on Jaime. Another volley of arrows is loosed, and this time an archer finds his mark in the giant's neck. Roaring in fury, the giant abandons its pursuit and turns to scan the battlements for the arrow's source. Settling on the soldier behind the scorpion, the giant snatches up a spear from the ground, gauges its weight and lets fly. The spear lifts the soldier clear off his feet and away into the night sky over Winterfell. Reading the situation immediately, Tyrion runs as fast as his legs will carry him along the battlements and across the wooden bridge to the broken tower. Scaling the ladder, he reaches the platform and takes command of the scorpion. Jamie's escape is halted before an impenetrable wall of warring bodies. He turns and faces his pursuer. The giant lunges forward and tries to crush Jamie beneath its boot. Jamie leaps out of the way, then rolls away again in the same instant to avoid a second stomp. As he gets to his feet, a scrum of living and undead barges into his back and knocks him into the mud. The giant looms over him. It raises its boot, the shadows swallowing Jamie whole. 
Tyrion carefully lines up his shot. The kickback of the scorpion ejects Tyrion backwards off the platform. He plummets through the air and lands heavily on the stack of lumber piled high against the broken tower. Jamie rolls his eyes in exasperation. Barely has he made it to his feet when the second giant arrives on the scene. Kingslayer! Jamie turns to find Jorah charging his recovered mount straight towards him. Pulling from the ground an abandoned flagpole still bearing its stark standard, Jorah gallops beyond Jamie, tossing him the flagpole as he passes, leveling the pole like a jouster's lance. Jamie buries it in the onrushing giant's thigh. Kono directs his stallion straight at the giant and, with the grace of a true Dothraki screamer, leaps up and balances atop the horse's back. At the last possible second before collision, Kono swings his twin arax in a stereo side slice and removes the giant's head from its body. The hound makes the most of his brutish strength, barging whites this way and that and lopping off any clawing hand that presumes to snatch at his person. Again. The hound follows Beric's voice, but finds instead an undead giant standing between them, its attention focused on the suddenly outmatched hound. Sandal! The hound whips his head around. Get down! The hound does as he's bid, dropping one knee into the muck. Arya runs up his back and launches herself. She sails through the air, burying her blades into the giant's eyeballs. Arya hangs on for dear life as the giant falls backwards like a felled tree. Retrieving her daggers, she looks back at the hound with an expectant eyebrow raised. The hound grunts and turns away, but discovers Gendry observing him with a smirk. Not a fucking word. 